I'm going to let you guys know as well before we go any farther. This is your warning, disclaimer, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of disturbing things in this video. This is where things get odd. In his hand was found a small picture of a boy that nobody knows who the boy is and they don't know the relationship that Phillips has to him. I've been doing research for this video for psh, four to five days and I can't stop thinking about that. This is Ray Lewis. In the 1994 National Championship game, he had a wide open hit on a running back. You could see Ray Lewis coming in like a heat-seeking missile. But when Lewis went to tackle the running back, the running back shrugged him off of him, and Lewis fell to the ground. The running back then proceeded to look at Lewis on the ground and state, quote-unquote, if you want to beat us, you're going to have to drag me off of this field. Man, oh man, what about that? And I know I've already said his name a bunch of times, but I'm going to remind you and emphasize it again. We're talking about Ray freaking Lewis, one of the hardest hitting linebackers of all time. This is Nick Saban. Well, not the Nick Saban you're accustomed to seeing. However, this was Nick Saban in his first year at Michigan State. And in his first ever game he coached at Michigan State, he went up against this same running back that shrugged off Ray Lewis in the national championship game. And I'm going to remind some of y'all, even when Nick Saban was at Michigan State, he was known as a defensive-minded head coach. But I guess the running back didn't get the memo about Nick Saban's defense as being really good because he went off for over 200 rushing yards and four touchdowns and beat Saban 50-10. to 10. And the greatest football coach of all time stated, quote unquote, I've never seen running backs like this in the NFL. I wanted to start off this video with those two quick stories just to give you somewhat of a perspective of what we're getting into. And I know all of you are really curious as to who this insane running back is, and he goes by the name of Mr. Lawrence Phillips. And as you can see from this picture right here, I'd say he looks like a fairly happy individual. But, and I have a big but, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, do not, and I mean absolutely do not let this smile fool you. This man was an absolute monster off the field, and he was fighting some real life demons. I don't know if I've ever, in the history of this channel, used the word monster to describe somebody. So let it be known right now, I don't take that statement lightly, and I don't want to label somebody as a monster. However, it's the reality of the situation. This young man was the definition of a certified menace to society, and it got to the point where regular people thought it was dangerous for him to not be locked up and to be walking the streets like a regular person. His behavior off the field is extremely, extremely, and I mean extremely puzzling. In the 1994 season for Nebraska, he had over 1,700 rushing yards and 16 touchdowns. Heading into 1995, everybody across the country was like, oh yeah, it's Raps. He's winning the Heisman Trophy. It wasn't even going to be competitive. He was going to run away with that Heisman Trophy in the 1995 season. At least that's what we thought. In the midst of that season, he got into, let's call it a tricky situation with no other than the man the myth, the legend himself, the backup quarterback for Nebraska at that time, Scott Frost. That name should ring a bell for a lot of you if you keep up with college football to the slightest, but here's a kicker with that. Lawrence Phillips, he wasn't even mad at Scott Frost himself. He was mad because his ex-girlfriend at the time was at Scott Frost's apartment. He wasn't fond of that whatsoever, and what Phillips did to her, it was rough, to say the least. Unfortunately, if it sounds like a lot already, there's a lot more because that was just one of the many incidents that Phillips had. Oh yeah, by the way, if you like conspiracy theory videos, you're going to want to stick around for the end of this video because we're going to talk about some conspiracy theories going around about the Lawrence Phillips situation and some interesting things that happened later in his life. There were some things that he did and some things that happened to him that just simply didn't add up. And there's a lot of questions people have about Lawrence Phillips even till this day. But however, it all circles back to the one. And I mean the one big question we're going to try to get to the bottom of in today's video. What really happened to Lawrence Phillips? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hope all of you are having a great and fantastic day. If not, hope this video can make it a little bit better. Major shout out to, check on this username, very unique here, Republican River Whitetails 8559 that might be the new record for the longest username I've ever seen, but that's pretty besides the point. Major shout out to this guy for recommending this video and thank you for the comment. And you can read the entire comment for yourself, but you see at the end here it states, his story is absolutely wild, and I don't want to say I didn't believe you, but I think calling it absolutely wild might be understating it. Before I did all my research and gathered information for this video, I was not prepared for what I was getting into. And it feels like I say this with every single video we do, but this is one of the craziest stories I've ever seen and covered. Philip's story is so bizarre and mind-boggling, and I'm not gonna lie to you guys. These really excite me because 
there's a mysterious element to it. For example, the last story video we made on the channel was about Maurice Claret, and that video, it wasn't puzzling, it wasn't mind-boggling, it was black and white. His story was cut and dry, yeah, there was a couple questionable things here and there, but outside of that, just a sad overall story that ended up being good because he turned his life around. With this one, though, every single decision that Lawrence Phillips made, it fascinated me, it really did. And what fascinates me, let me clarify a little bit more here, is the psychology behind his decision making. You'll see what I'm talking about later in this video. As always, if you have any recommendations for story videos like this one, feel free to leave a comment down below, and who knows, we might make that video. Your boy Matt is a fan of the people, and I want to make content that people want to see. Simple as that. And then two, I haven't said this in a couple of videos, but if you're new to the channel, and you're simply not subscribed, or maybe you've been watching and you haven't hit that subscribe button, consider joining our community. We love to have you here, and it helps out the channel tremendously. If you like college football content, some NFL content sprinkled in here and there, basketball, etc., etc., I think you enjoy your time here. It is the off-season of college football, so what we do during the off-season, that is make documentary videos like this one. I enjoy them, and it seems like you guys enjoy them as well. I gotta throw this in here at the beginning of the video as well. YouTube, this video is for informational and educational purposes only. That's all. I'm going to let you guys know as well before we go any farther. This is your warning, disclaimer, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of disturbing things in this video. Some of the things we're going to talk about and go over in this video, they are sensitive subjects for some people. Yet again, just want to give you a warning before we go any farther. I've jibber jabber enough though. All right, Matt, blah, blah, blah. Shut the crap up. Now, without further ado, let's get in. Man, oh man, good old Lawrence Phillips. And come on, man, you already know to get into his story, we gotta throw it all the way back to where things started. Mr. Lawrence Phillips was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. However, due to his mother and father getting a divorce, his mother wanted a better life for him, so she moved him to Inglewood, California. Of course, hindsight's 2020, but he might have been better off staying in Arkansas because in California, he lived a miserable life as a kid. I have so much sympathy for him, and it's even hard for me to talk about because I don't think any kid deserves to grow up like this and they shouldn't have to go through this but his mother wasn't the greatest of mothers when lawrence was growing up she never told him not even once that she loved him and matter of fact she refused to say it to go on top of that his mother constantly had new boyfriends coming and going and a couple of these boyfriends they verbally and physically assaulted lawrence phillips we're talking about a kid guys as a fourth grader he would tell administrators at his school that he was scared of being home and he didn't want to go back there and it eventually got to the point where in fifth grade, I guess he was mad enough to feel like he could live on his own, so he ran away and he never went back. The state of California did take action on this, and they made him go to a foster home for one year, and he hated it. It was awful, and that foster home, they wound up getting shut down a few years later for some just terrible things they were doing, which is a different conversation for a different day. And when I say terrible things, that's probably a bad way of saying it. Let me clarify here. The foster home he was in, it wasn't functional. It wasn't a good environment for anybody there. Fortunately enough, though, a lady, and I'm going to label her as an angel because she saved Lawrence Phillips' life at that time, she moved him into a group foster home, which is way better. If you don't know what a group foster home is, it's just a regular house, so not something like a typical foster home, and you're in that house with three, four, or five other kids that are also foster kids. And the reason Miss Barbara Thomas did this for these kids is because she wanted them to live a regular life like other kids out there. Because when you're in the stereotypical foster home, you're not doing stuff like normal kids, going on vacation, going out to eat, etc, etc. One of the main things, though, that Barbara Thomas did for all their kids living in that home was she didn't make them, but she encouraged them to play sports. And it goes back to something I've always believed in. Kids playing sports, I don't want to say it's a necessity of life, but they should do it. It keeps them out of trouble, gives them something to do, you make friends, it's a win-win. And that's what happened for Lawrence Phillips here, and you don't gotta be a rocket scientist to figure out what sport he was playing. Football. And the funny thing about all of this is Barbara Thomas was actually worried that Phillips was gonna get hurt. Come to find out, he was the one that was gonna be hurting other people. And while Phillips was living in this group home, the only incident he ever got in was another fight with a kid that was also living there. To be honest, I don't think too much of that, just due to the fact when you're growing up and you have a brother or sister, heck, you get in fights. Although Phillips and this random kid he got into a fight with, they weren't blood related or blood brothers, I view it from the same standpoint. You live under the same house with somebody for long enough, Stuff is gonna get, I'm not gonna say heated, but you're gonna have your disagreements. Outside of that, no problems whatsoever, but here's some foreshadowing. I want you to remember the fact that his mother never loved him, never gave him 
any attention really and him being assaulted by his mother's boyfriends as a kid. All those bad things that happened to him when he was in third, fourth, fifth grade, it comes back in this story. Fast forward in time a little bit, he attended West Covina High School where one coach stated he had comic book muscle and speed. And he was good for West Covina, but shortly after, he wound up transferring to Baldwin Park. Baldwin Park is also located in California, and here's the ironic part about this. They would play his former team, West Covina. And to start the game off, West Covina, they was kicking off to Baldwin Park. And the head coach told him, whatever you do, he's telling the kicker this, do not kick it to Lawrence Phillips. Yeah, you probably know what I'm about to say next. He kicked it to Lawrence Phillips and he took it back for a touchdown. What can I say here is a stud, but here's something that stood out a lot to me when gathering information for this video. Lawrence Phillips, unlike 98% of these videos and story videos we make, he wasn't like your stereotypical jock. He was quiet, kept to himself, didn't really like attention, but here was a kicker with all this. He was extremely smart. When I say extremely smart, let me give you a better perspective here. In high school, he completed two years worth of high school work in one year. His grades were also oddly good. He was a high B, low A student in every single class almost. I wanted to throw that in there because you couldn't make the argument and try to say, well, oh, he wasn't intellectually smart because he was. Heck man, now that I think about it, you could argue and say that he was smarter than your average person. By this point in time, as a junior, senior in high school, he's got all of these college coaches drooling over him, and this is when Tom Osborne, the head coach at Nebraska, he came to visit him. Osborne went to Lawrence Phillips' head coach's house, and they all had a meeting, and according to the head coach at the time, Phillips only asked Osborne one question. Who wears number one? This is where Osborne proceeded to say, you do. And that was it. Lawrence Phillips wound up praying over his decision where he wanted to go. He woke up the next morning and he committed to Nebraska. His freshman season for Nebraska in 1993, it was solid. He had 508 rushing yards to be exact, averaging over five yards per pop and five touchdowns. Fast forward time a little bit to our sophomore season here. I don't want to say that people weren't prepared for what they're about to see next, but he most certainly turned some heads. His sophomore year in 1994, that was his breakout season, and it wasn't even fair out there. When I was watching the film on him, and by the way, I hate that I can't show you guys the film, but due to copyright rules, I can't show you it, unfortunately. Like I was saying, though, when I was watching the film, I was sitting here and all, and I was like, man, he might potentially be one of the most graceful running backs I've ever ever seen in my life. The way he ran the football, it was a sight to see, and I would say it was almost strategic. It was like he knew every single time what gap to hit, when to hit it, and how hard to hit it. He was just simply better than everybody else, and that equated to him rushing for over 1,700 yards and 16 touchdowns. In this year, this is where Nebraska matched up with Miami in the championship, and this is where he meets Ray Lewis. And at the beginning of the game, like I told you in the intro, this is where Ray Lewis, he has a wide open clean shot at him. Lewis goes to hit him, and he hits him, but Phillips doesn't fall down. As a matter of fact, Lewis is the one who falls down. When he stands up, Phillips looks at him and says, you're going to have to drag me off of this field if you want to win. In that championship game, Phillips had 19 carries for 96 yards and more importantly, won the game. At this point in time in our story, things are looking great for Phillips. He's coming off a great season in 94, just won a national championship, and he's already the early favorite to win the Heisman Trophy in 95. All he's got to do, and I'm talking about all he's got to do, is stay out of trouble and stay out of the way, and he's going to be a multi-millionaire in the NFL. But as we've come to know, and if you've watched some of our story videos, that's the hard part for these players. It's not on the field stuff. It's off the field, staying out of trouble. To me, that's the easiest part out of everything these guys do, but I digress. Shortly after defeating Big and Bad Miami in the 9-4 championship, he was involved with an assault charge and vandalism charge. Allegedly, he grabbed a college student around the neck. Nothing ever came out of this. He didn't miss any time due to this whatsoever. Also, got to throw this in there. He was involved in an eligibility issue because apparently and allegedly, a sports agent paid for a $100 lunch for him in that offseason. To make a long story short here, nothing came out of that, and to start the 1995 season, he was completely eligible and he was fine. In that first game to start off the 1995 Heisman campaign for Lawrence Phillips, he matched up with Michigan State, but more importantly, Nick Saban. Not one of Nick Saban's brighter moments. This is where his defense allowed over 200 rushing yards to Lawrence Phillips and four touchdowns and lost 50 to 10. But only two and a half hours later, after this Heisman Trophy contending running back just put up over 200 rushing yards and four touchdowns against a Nick Saban-led defense, he made a decision that would alter his life and his football career forever. This decision was very bad. 
It involved a girl that goes by the name of Kate. We'll get to her in just a second. But it also involved a teammate of his that goes by the name of Scott Frost. Yeah, that's right. You heard me correctly. The Scott Frost. This is Miss Kate, very lovely young lady, and she was on the basketball team for Nebraska at the time as well. Her and Lawrence Phillips, allegedly, because they never attested to this, but other people have, were boyfriend and girlfriend. If it wasn't official, though, the whole point is they most definitely were talking with each other. They were seeing each other. There was a thing going on there. Well, after this game against Michigan State, in which, yet again, Phillips had over 200 rushing yards and four touchdowns, him and Kate, they were supposed to have a date. There appeared to be some misunderstanding, though, because Kate, she didn't think they were supposed to have a date, and Phillips thought they were having a date. So Kate, not thinking too much about it, I mean, why would she? She didn't think they were having a date. She goes out and she parties with her friends. When Kate and her friends got done partying, they decided to go back and hang out at Scott Frost's apartment. No big deal. According to some of Phillips' teammates, at the time, they stated, this is according to his friends, him and Kate were already broken up. And now we're going around the block is Kate is dating the new backup quarterback, Scott Frost. Obviously, goes without being said, I wouldn't label it as animosity. Well, maybe it was. We'll get to that in just a second. But there was most definitely some love that was lost between Phillips and Kate. Phillips told some of his teammates, oh yeah, it's no big deal. I'll go find another girl. But in reality, he was upset about it. Here's where things start to get haywire. At 3 a.m. that same night, Lawrence Phillips, he gets a call from somebody stating, that Kate is staying at Scott Frost's apartment because all their friends, they've already left. So it's just Scott Frost and Kate. When I saw that, here's my biggest question. Number one, who was watching Scott Frost's apartment to see all those people leave? And number two, why are you snitching? Why are you instigating it? Well, now that I think about it, maybe it's not as crazy as I made it out to seem because more than likely, here's what happened. Lawrence Phillips, he called one of his buddies that might have been even at the party because they had to be at the party to know those people are leaving, and he told them, hey, if Kate stays over at Scott's apartment, let me know about it. That's probably what happened. I'm just assuming here, but it's really besides the point. The point is, and all you need to know, is Kate, Scott Frost, it looks like they're about to spend the night together. This is Jay Stems, former running back for Nebraska as well, teammate of Lawrence Phillips, and he stated, if Phillips was drinking, you didn't want to be around him. He was dangerous. Getting back on track here, though, it's 3 a.m., Lawrence gets his call, hey, Looking like old Kate here, she's about to spend the night with the backup quarterback, six foot three, strong, handsome Scott Frost. Lawrence Phillips says, hey, not on my watch, buddy. I'm pulling up. I'm showing up. I don't know why I said pulling up and showing up is the same thing, Matt, you freaking idiot. But you get the point. He pulled up. Shows up to Scott's apartment, knocks on the door. Kate walks up to it, looks through the eye hole. She doesn't open the door. She looks at the eye hole. She tells Scott, hey. It's Lawrence Phillips. And here's where things get crazy. So Scott Frost, being the manly man he is, he probably doesn't think too much about it. He's going to defuse the situation. He opens the door, but there's nobody there. No Lawrence Phillips. Peeks his head out, looks to the left, looks to the right. He's like, huh, guess nobody's there. Or whoever was there, they left. Well, here's where things get scary, man. And this gives me chills. So while Scott Frost is looking around the hallways, Meanwhile, Lawrence Phillips is climbing up the apartment and he sneaks through Scott Frost's window in his bedroom. Or my bad, my bad, my bad, my apologies. Not the bedroom window, but he got up to the balcony door and it was unlocked, so he opened it and he came in. You know how apartments have balconies, right? So he somehow climbed up that, got onto the balcony, and lucky enough for him, the door was open. According to Scott Frost, at first, he tried talking with Lawrence Phillips, tried to calm him down, and the only thing that happened was Phillips pushed him, or quote-unquote, shoved him against the wall. That's all he did to Scott Frost. After that, this is where Phillips proceeded to grab Kate by her hair and drag her down three flights of stairs. When he got done pulling her down those three flights of stairs, this is where he pinned her in a corner and pounded her head against the wall repeatedly. When he got done roughing Kate up, he punched some mailboxes. He pretty much destroyed that entire apartment complex. He flees the scene, and while he's fleeing the scene, the cops are showing up. But he calls one of his, what is labeled as mentors, and he states on the phone, I tried to kill her. Phillips will later turn himself in. However, this was just the beginning to what's about to happen next. You got the best player in the country who's about to run away with the Heisman allegedly beating up some girl, shoving Scott Frost against the wall. This was huge news back then. Imagine this happening in the modern era. A Heisman front runner doing something like Phillips did. I don't think there's any question about it whatsoever. He'd be kicked off of the team. 
that leads me into my next point perfectly. That was a controversial part about all this, because Phillips was not kicked off of Nebraska. The vice chancellor of student affairs interviewed the girl, Kate, and she stated that Phillips did not strike her or did not touch her. And that's what saved Lawrence Phillips, because if she would have stated he struck her, they would have kicked him off of the team, but since she said he didn't, they left him on the team. But even though she stated he didn't strike her, everybody thought she was just saying that because she was trying to protect him and his football career. Instead of kicking Phillips off the team, Tom Osborne, head coach of Nebraska, he suspended him indefinitely. I know most people know what that means, but for those of you that don't know what that means, in other terms here, when you're suspended indefinitely, it can be as long as three years or three days. Suspended indefinitely does not mean you're kicked off of the team. You'll be brought back when the coach feels like he's ready to bring you back. And Tom Osborne got a lot of hate for this, but I understand why he was doing it. It's the same reason Nick Saban hated kicking off players as well, because that's the worst thing you can do for them, because they're going to ruin their life even more. Look, I'm not here to sit up here and say that he should have or shouldn't have kicked him off of the team. As a matter of fact, we'll leave that up for a debate in the comment section. Let me know your thoughts on that down below. What I'm saying is I understand where he's coming from and why he didn't kick him off. And he stated numerous times if he kicked him off of the team, it would have ruined his life. Anyways, like I was saying, instead of kicking him off the team, he sends Philip to go to a psychiatrist and seek some mental health. After doing a lot of studies and tests, that psychiatrist stated there's nothing wrong with him whatsoever. And the one argument they provided was him playing football and him being a part of an organized group. He needs that. I think you know where I'm about to go with this. Tom Osborne, he let him back on the team. Nebraska, more importantly, Osborne bringing him back, it drawed a lot, and I mean a lot of criticism. But me personally, I feel strongly about putting your hands on a woman. If this would have happened in 2023 or 2024, nah, he'd have been off the team. Although there was a lot of controversy brewing around that Nebraska football team, they blocked out all the outside noise because they made it to another national championship. In that 1995 season, they matched up against Florida in the championship in which the head coach of Florida at the time was the old ball coach and Steve Spurrier. Heading into that ball game, and this is a crazy stat considering where Nebraska is now. I mean, they suck. But Nebraska won 24 straight games before they matched up with Florida. 24 straight. That is so crazy to think about. So crazy. And that national championship game was really interesting. And even now looking back on it because Nebraska was known as this smash mouth football team. They're going to out physical you. In Florida, they were your typical run and gun team. But here's the problem with Florida in this national championship game. Somebody on the coaching staff forgot to tell them that to win a national championship, you got to play some defense. They didn't play a look of defense. We're talking about the 90s, guys. They gave up 62 to Nebraska in the 90s. They didn't just not have an answer for Phillips. They didn't have an answer for anybody. But I know this video is surrounded around Phillips, and in that game, he had 165 rushing yards. Not bad, man. Not bad whatsoever. Won a national championship in 94 and 95, and he's one of the best players in the nation. Yeah, he had a hiccup along the way, and trust me, I know, calling it a hiccup is heavily understating it. But outside of that hiccup that cost him a Heisman Trophy... Life was good. If you are curious, though, because I know some of you guys like looking at these stats and numbers like myself, in that 95 season, he only played in five games in which he had 547 rushing yards, averaging 7.7 .7 yards per carry and nine touchdowns. Dude was a beast. I know we're playing the what-if game here, but if he played that entire season in 95... I'm not too sold on the fact that he wouldn't have got 2,000 rushing yards. I think he would have surpassed that 2,000 yard mark. I think he probably would have got 2,000 yards, but that's really besides the point. Moving along here in our story, he enters the NFL draft, shocked to nobody whatsoever. Some teams were skeptical of him because of obvious red flags that have been thrown out there. Some people stated if he didn't have all these character concerns, he potentially might have been the number one pick in the draft that year. At the time, most people thought he was a lock to go to the Baltimore Ravens with the fourth overall pick, but they wound up taking an offensive tackle. So he fell to the sixth overall pick, and he went to the St. Louis Rams. Something interesting to note here, though, when he signed his contract in July of 1996, there was no signing bonus. He did sign a three-year, $5.6 million deal, but the no signing bonus, that was interesting. If you're wondering why they didn't give him a signing bonus, it's because of all of the character concerns and problems he caused at Nebraska. But here's what fascinated me the most about the Rams not giving him the signing bonus. If you're concerned enough with him to not give him a signing bonus due to all the red flags and character concerns, why did you draft him? But the six overall pick, you see what I'm saying? That was odd to me, and I'm kind of shocked he even agreed to sign a contract with no signing bonus. That's dumb. Lawrence Phillips, he knows he's not dumb. He's a crash out. Any given day, 
It could be a random day, nothing going on. He knows dang well he could ruin his life and ruin his career. At least go down with some money. And his first year for St. Louis in the year of 1996, not too bad, but more importantly, stayed out of trouble. In 15 games played in which he started 11 of those, he had 632 rushing yards with four touchdowns. I know, not the craziest big time hot shot numbers in the world, but that whole organization, they just wanted this guy to stay out of trouble. That was a win in their books if he was on the field. Because remember, in this life, your best ability is availability. Heading into his second year was also pretty solid. In 10 games played in which he started nine of those, he had 633 rushing yards and eight touchdowns. But during this fantastic, and let me emphasize that word, fantastic season that Lawrence Phillips was having for the St. Louis Rams, the problems they started to quickly arise again. Phillips would stay on at bars until 4 a.m. on the night before games. In other terms here, the dude was hung over trying to play NFL football games. During warm-ups before one of their games, he collapsed on the field, and when the trainers went over to talk to him, they could smell alcohol on his breath. The head coach at the time, he wasn't too happy about this, so he decides to call Phillips in for a meeting. The head coach asked Phillips, what would you do if you were the new head coach of the St. Louis Rams? And Phillips, he was crying when he answered the question, but he stated, I would fire me. You wanna take a wild guess at what the head coach proceeded to do next? He fired him. They cut him. That right there, I want to talk about that a little bit. It saddens me to even hear that Lawrence Phillips looked the head coach in the eyes and stated, yeah, I would fire me. He's got tears in his eyes saying it. It's almost like Phillips knew what he was doing was bad, but he couldn't control it. And I forgot to throw this in here as well, my apologies, but there was multiple times where Phillips would get pissed off at practice and he would leave. And come on, man. This is the NFL. It's a profession. It's a job. You can't just leave your job when you get pissed off. There was numerous times as well where he wouldn't show up to meetings and he wouldn't show up to practices. There was a lot of stuff that led up to him getting kicked off of the team. But the whole alcohol and showing up hungover to the games, that was the final straw. This man was fighting demons. And the more videos we do on players like this, the more sympathetic I start to become. Because the one thing I've realized is people are just wired differently, and I think some people, they can't help themselves. What captivates me the most about Mr. Lawrence Phillips here, especially with his time with the Rams, is I can't even rationalize for a split second why he would do the things he did. Take away all the bad things he did in Nebraska, wipe him out. Look at where he's at in life. Sixth overall pick in the NFL draft, Got all the money in the world. You're playing football for a living. Life's great. But despite that, you still choose to be a borderline alcoholic. You still choose to not show up to practices. You're not ready for games. It's hard to understand. The psychology behind it, it fascinates me. It really does. I just don't get it. I don't understand how somebody in that position could or even would want to squander their life and career like that. I wonder if it's a situation where people like this they just simply don't care to ruin their life. Maybe they just don't care about the repercussions. I don't know what it could be. And maybe I shouldn't be as sympathetic as I'm being, because you know your boy Matt, I can be hard-nosed at times. I have my fair share of moments where I say, yeah, I don't feel bad for you if you decide to throw away millions and millions of dollars and ruin your career that 99% of us would just dream of having. There's something about this story, though, where I feel like, Lawrence Phillips here, he's just simply fighting demons, and that's what I'm chalking it up to. And oh yeah, by the way, if you think this story is even close to coming to an end, you are sadly mistaken, because we are just getting started. We haven't even gotten to the juicy stuff yet, so buckle up. And matter of fact, get your refill on your popcorn, candy, or snack you're eating, because things are about to heat up. And don't act like you don't eat food when you're watching a YouTube video, because come on, man. You can't eat a meal without watching a good video. After getting cut by the Rams, the Dolphins, they decided to give him a second chance. Unfortunately, though, his career at Miami only lasted a couple of weeks, two games to be exact, because the Dolphins released him after he assaulted a woman at a nightclub. Yeah, I think some of you might be starting to pick up on some pattern recognition here with women. Lawrence Phillips, we knew at Nebraska he had anger problems, but here's the thing. We thought, or some people thought he might have fixed those, but he didn't. After the Dolphins released him, he joined the NFL Europe League in which he played for the Barcelona Dragons. And guess what? For the NFL Europe League, he was a baller. He was named MVP of the league. He had over 1,000 yards and 14 touchdowns, but man, this dude, you could tell. He was one of the best running backs in the entire world. It's a flat out shame that he couldn't stay out of trouble because if this guy had the right head on his shoulders, he might be one of the best running backs of all time. I know that's a bold statement and claim, but anybody that has watched Phillips play, 
you know I'm right. Since Phillips dominated the NFL Europe League, some NFL teams, they were taking a look at him, and believe it or not, he got another chance. The San Francisco 49ers, they signed him in 1999, and everybody thought they were dumb for doing that. Nobody thought it was good. They already thought he had way too many chances, and they thought he'd screw it up. When Phillips got introduced to the team, he stated in a press conference, quote unquote, this is a great opportunity, and I don't tend to screw it up. You want to take a wild guess of what happens next? He screwed it up. While he was playing for San Francisco, he got an apartment in Beverly Hills in which him and his girlfriend they were living at. Their relationship, it wasn't going so good, so his girlfriend decided to end things with him. When she told him she wanted to break up, this is when Phillips assaulted her. During that season as well, it is worth noting that him and the coaching staff, they were constantly bumping heads. Why were they bumping heads, you may ask? Oh, well, it had a little something to do with. Phillips didn't like to practice. He didn't like to show up to meetings either. And it got so bad that the 49ers had to suspend him for three games due to conduct detrimental to the team. And oh yeah, I might as well throw this in here. Lawrence Phillips is the player who missed the blocking assignment in which Steve Young got hit on. And after that hit, Steve Young never played a nerd down to football. A lot of people pointed towards that though and stated the reason he missed the blocking assignment is because... He never showed up to practices, and he didn't do all the little things to be great in the NFL. Finally, in November of 1999, though, the 49ers, they waived him. Fast forward time a little bit here to 2001, Phillips would sign with the Florida Bobcats of the Arena Football League. But nothing ever came out of that because he decided to quit the team without telling the head coach. Just another example of Lawrence Phillips only caring about himself. That's what it seems like. He only cares about him. After that weird thing with the AFL, he decided to join the Canadian Football League. And for this Canadian Football League, he went off. He had over 1,000 yards and 13 touchdowns. But when he was playing in Montreal for this Canadian team, he assaulted another woman. And according to this woman, he put his hands around her throat and stated, now you're going to see the real Lawrence Phillips. In 2003, this is when the CFL, they decided, yeah, we're done with this guy and... That was wraps for that. At this point in time in our story, Phillips had no alternative routes. The NFL was done with him, the AFL was done with him, and the CFL was done with him. It seemed like football was over for him, and plus he got to the point where he didn't love the game anymore. With that being said, he decided to move to San Diego, California to spend the rest of his life, in which, when he got there, he met a girl that goes by the name of Emilia Weisler. It's deja vu, man. This happened with every girl he was with. At first, it was great, he was a gentleman, and then... The demons, they started to come out. The girl you're looking at right here, Amelia Weisler, his girlfriend, she owned the apartment they was living in. And it got to the point where the relationship, it wasn't as good as it once was. And she told him, like former girlfriends told him, hey, I think it's time that we move on or go our separate ways. When Amelia stated that to Phillips, you could see the rage in his eyes. He wasn't happy. I can't show you the photos or anything like that. Just know it's bad, really bad. And the person who was examining the girl stated it was the worst strangulation marks they've ever seen. A couple days go by. Lawrence Phillips' cousin calls the girl he did this to and states, Hey, Lawrence is really sorry. He wants to see you. He just wants to talk to you. And the girl still having, I guess, some love for him and a soft spot for him. She decides to go see him. As to why you'd want to see a man who dang near killed you, I don't know. Different conversation for a different day. She decides, you know what, I'm going to give her a chance. She goes to see Phillips, and the same thing happened again. But this time, he takes it to another level. Not only did he rough her up, but he stole her car as well. And I'm going to let you know right now, you can't predict what Lawrence Phillips did next. No way. You're not ready for what I'm about to say. Lawrence Phillips, in this car that he has hijacked from his ex-girlfriend after choking her out, strangling her, whatever word you want to throw in there, he sees some kids, teenagers, playing on a football field. So he stops and joins in with them. I mean, seriously, what in the heck is going through this man's mind? Do you know how weird it is for a grown man to see kids playing football and stop and say, hey, can I join in with y'all and play? Rather alone, you doing it after hijacking a car? And here's why it's so weird. It's Lawrence Phillips, one of the most gifted running backs of all time, despite all the stuff he did off the field. What do you have to prove against teenagers playing for fun? As bizarre as that situation was, he gets done playing with them, and when he goes to put his shoes on that he left by a bench, he noticed some money he had in the shoes was stolen. It was missing. Phillips then proceeds to start interrogating and blaming all the kids and saying, oh yeah, one of you had to steal my money. And what he does next is even more ridiculous. He gets in that hijacked car that he just stole a couple hours ago, and he hits one of the kids. It's just like, man, 
what is wrong with this guy? Even if one of the kids did steal your 20 bucks, who cares? That doesn't give you the right to start running over people. Don't get me wrong. I hate a thief as much as the next person. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things I hate most in this world. But I'm not finna start playing Mario Kart trying to hit somebody because I think they stole my $20. I think it's more than safe to say that this guy is nothing short of a nutcase. Of course, they wound up catching him and he got sentenced to jail for all the crimes he committed. I say all the crimes he committed because it's so many, I'm not gonna get up here and list them off. Pretty much sum up here all the stuff he did to all the women he's interacted with and the thing with hitting the kid with the car. Now, while Phillips was in prison, one thing that stood out to me is... He wrote notes back to his ex-girlfriends, and I'll show you some of them right here, but he also wrote notes to his former head coaches and former teammates. And in these notes, letters, whatever you want to call them, one thing that stood out to everybody that read them is how neat his cursive writing was. Just remember these cursive letters for, well, you're going to see in just a second. Just pay attention. In 2015, Phillips was given a new cellmate that goes by the name of Jay Sowers. Soward was a crip, and there was a lot of gangs that were involved in that prison, but Phillips, he didn't want any association with the gangs whatsoever. And one night, Soward, he was pacing around the cellmate they were in when he pulls out a shank and he starts going after Phillips. And remember, we're talking about an all-time athlete here, Lawrence Phillips, big, strong guy. Well, somehow, someway, he overpowers Soward, and he puts him in a chokehold. He winds up choking him out. Soward, he passes out on the ground, and Phillips, he picks up the shank and flushes it down the toilet. Apparently and allegedly, Phillips, he had no plans of, you know, killing Soward. He just wanted to choke him out, make him pass out for a few minutes. But his cellmate who attacked him, he didn't make it. So you see how this looks, right? The whole argument Phillips even had was, hey, Soward, he attacked me with a shank. But there's no shank in there because he flushed it down the toilet. But the defense against Phillips stated the reason Phillips strangled him isn't because a uh, sour went after him. It's because Phillips didn't want a cellmate. That's it. Which I guess is a decent argument. Let me know in the comment section. What do you think happened? Do you think Soward attacked Phillips and Phillips reacted in self-defense? Or do you think... Phillips, he just went after him because he didn't want a cellmate. Shortly after that whole incident, Lawrence Phillips, he was found, passed away in his jail cell due to hanging himself. But here's where the conspiracy theories, they start to come into effect. This is where things get odd. In his hand was found a small picture of a boy that nobody knows who the boy is and they don't know the relationship that Phillips has to him. I've been doing research for this video for... Psh, four to five days and I can't stop thinking about that and I get some of you may brush that side like Matt that's no big deal but to me there's something eerie about that there's something odd about that and I'm getting chills even thinking about it who would the boy even be I don't know man I really don't but there's one thing for sure I think there's more to all of this. Maybe that's just me, but here's where things get even more interesting. There was a note that was found in one of his socks after he passed away and it was clear and obvious he didn't write that note. It wasn't his handwriting. And the reason for that is because he always, more times than not, was writing in cursive. And this was in print. And when I say print, I mean just regular standard handwriting, not cursive. Something to think about, something for your train of thought. And also it was stated that there wasn't just one, but multiple guards at that prison that didn't get along with Phillips. I'm not saying I don't believe he didn't off himself. What I'm saying is there's some speculation that somebody else might have had a playing things here. Some of you are going to remember, and I know this has been an extremely long video, at the beginning I told you to remember all those bad things that happened to him when he was growing up as a kid involving his mother and his mother's boyfriends. Well now we're going to talk about that a little bit. To me, I think the way kids are raised, it impacts their life a lot. This isn't my opinion, it is a proven statistic. Kids that grow up in nice neighborhoods with nice parents, nice mother, nice father, etc, etc, just good environments, they turn out better. Whereas, on the flip side here, case and example here, you got a kid who grew up in a rough environment, rough household, they turn out worse. Granted, you have exceptions. You got kids that grow up in great environments that turn out 
bad and you have kids that grew up in bad environments that turn out good but those are exceptions we call them exceptions for a reason for the most part and i'm sure many of you have heard this saying you are who you hang out with and you are a product of your environment that's not anything against you or anybody else that's human nature if you have 99 friends that are multi-millionaires well guess what there's a good chance you're going to be the 100th multi-millionaire on the contrary if you have 99 friends and all 99 of them are drug dealers well, there's a good chance you're going to be the 100th drug dealer. So with that being said, I think all the bad things that happened to Phillips growing up, his mother neglecting him, not showing him enough love, him being verbally and physically assaulted by his mother's boyfriends, yeah, I think that played into what happened later into his life a lot. My conclusion on all this is he had anger growing up. I think he was angry that his mother neglected him. I think he was angry that he went through all those bad things, and rightfully so. What transpired after that is Lawrence Phillips, for better or for worse, well, not for better, but for worse here, he took out that anger on other people. I'm not saying it would have happened, but if he would have grew up in a household with a loving mother, loving father, and a great city, I think his story might have turned out differently. And maybe it wouldn't have, you never know, but I firmly believe what happened to him at a young age, it affected him drastically. At the end of the day, yes, I feel so, 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 and I mean so bad for him that as a child, he had to go through all those bad things. But just because somebody mistreats you, just because you're dealt a bad hand in this life, it doesn't give you the right to do bad things to other people. Especially putting your hands on a female, and it's not like he just did it once or twice, he did it four to five times. In my opinion, if you put your hands on a female, you are beneath pond scum to me. Unacceptable behavior. Unacceptable. I uh, hope you guys learned something from this video. It took a lot of time, a lot of effort. So, hope you enjoyed as well. Let me know your thoughts down below. But, da